like seminar. Uh, in case you don't know, there is a post-seminar reception. Uh, who's the, who's the uh, organizer of it? Uh, he might actually be there. He's there. Oh, he's there working on it. Good, yeah. good. Okay. <laughs> um, and let's see. So everybody's invited to that, I think. Uh, I guess they are now. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Peter Allen. Uh, Peter has been a professor of computer science at Columbia for uh, quite a while. Yeah, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, there's a lot I could say about uh, Peter. I'm just going to give you my own kind of, uh, you know, what's the, the high point for me. Uh, as many of you know, there's been a lot of changes in the last, uh, I don't know, five, ten years or so in grasping. So. Um, uh, there's been a lot of progress, there's a, a lot of software out there, there's a lot of demos happening at uh, mater materials handling conferences. I even saw a materials handling journal that declared piece picking was a solved problem, <laughs> which might be a little bit premature, but uh, you know, it's just one indication of how much progress there has been. And I'll just point out that if you trace back, uh, you'll find that uh, the Peter and his colleagues deserve an awful lot of credit for that work. If you're interested in following up on that, I would suggest you could probably Google the word eigengrasps and uh, get a pretty good start on it. Uh, so that's just one thing about uh, among many, but uh, uh, at least the introduction is terse. <laughs> and so uh, please join me in welcoming Peter Allen. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, and uh, I appreciate uh, being invited here. And I must say, um, I'm impressed by a turnout on a Friday afternoon. Um, you know, at Columbia, we'd be searching for bodies somewhere, and we wouldn't find too many. So you guys have a light? Uh, that, <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> but yeah, we have a few distractions where I live. But um, yeah, but still, it's really nice. And, and it's great to be in a community where, you know, the. Word robot is in some kind of alien idea, and everybody understands it. So thanks again. Um, I'm going to talk today about grasping, but I just want to give you a little overview of some of the other stuff we're working on so you're familiar with what Columbia does. Um, we do a lot of work in surgical robots and visual tracking of, of arms. Um, we've done a lot of work recently in deformable object grasping and manipulation for soft objects, um, focusing on garments and clothing. And we've done a lot of work in assistive robotics, and particularly in looking at both EEG and EMG to control robots, and from an HIR, HRI perspective, to do BCI. So if you're interested in these, go to my website or talk to me afterwards at the reception. We'll be glad to give you some information on these ideas. OK. So as Matt just said, there's been a lot of change in grasping over the years, particularly recently. Um, and this is what it used to look like. Um, you have, you know, a scene segmenter, um, some kind of object representation, a recognition, a ransack method. Um, you do grasp planning, you have to do pose recognition, um, and then you do a grasp execution. And, you know, I'm, I'm guilty as charged for this model just as well as my, anybody else. Um, but we've seen a lot more now of enabling general purpose for gra grasping systems with learning to grasp. So, from a simulated prior experience stored in representation that makes grasping easy. So you can see that you have uh, generated a massive simulated data set of experiences. You find creative representations to efficiently encode these data sets with, and then you utilize these past experiences to accomplish tasks in the real world. So this is getting to be more of the paradigm. And I'm going to talk a little bit about maybe a hybrid between the two that we've worked on, um, but they're both interesting models to explore. So in turning to learning to grasp, I went and did a little homework on my own work, and we realized we'd done it for longer than I thought. <laughs> so you know, we started out in 2004 with a support vector machine for uh, robotic grasping that was very uh, kind of primitive, I would say. But yet, uh, it's probably one of the most cited articles of, of our work because it was really an early idea that we had that we could actually try to do classifiers on grasps, and it was very nice. And then we went into this whole thing with dimensionality reduction, with eigengrasps, and on and on and on. I'm not going to go through all these papers, but the idea is that we've really been active in trying to remember how to do this through a learning process. So I'll give you a little roadmap of today's talk, okay? We're going to first start out with um, 
a little history, which is some data-driven grasping that we did starting back around 2009. Um, and here we create an indexable database of grasps across objects and hands using simulation. And one of the themes that you'll see a lot here is we like to use simulation um, because we can find it works fast, it's efficient, um, it seems to translate pretty well to the real world in most cases that we're looking at. And so that'll be a theme that you'll see throughout here. And then we'll go on to these other parts as we go through here. Uh, ultimately, it's getting to a point where we're going to talk about including tactile as well as visual information in grasping. So some of the themes. We need lots and lots of data to do learning to grasp, okay? We have so many different objects. We have many different grasps for an object. We have many different material properties in objects. And we have many different robotic hands. So you have a very big space here to explore if you want to learn. So is there a solution? And one of the solutions we said is to simulate and to generate training data through this. So you'll see that theme in most of the work you're going to see from now on. So in the first part, we're talking about data-driven grasping, which we did a while back. Um, we asked this question, is grasping indexable? And there have been many previous attempts to taxonomize grasps, okay, from very simple tree structures or power grasps, pinch grasps, whatever. And we wanted to know, if, was there a finite set of grasps that we can pre-compute? And if so, we could build an indexable database of grasps. And then given a new object to grasp, you can find a similar grasp, and that was the basic concept. And the problems are there are lots of objects to grasp, as we said, and lots of degrees of freedom in hands, and lots of different robotic hands. And so it sounds intractable, but maybe not. So the quick history of data-driven grasping from our group was um, we had ability to build a database uh, using object models, 3D object models. And we had high quality form closure grasps from multiple hands, thousands of objects, hundreds of thousands of grasps. And we used that for a data-driven grasp planner. And we did a benchmark on the grass planners and how well they were. And in this case, we had 238,000 different grass, over 7,200 objects over four scales and four different hands. And basically, this was the engine for it, which is the, the database. And so just give you an idea of the scope of this. So we took object models, and most of these are not so realistic like trees, but you can think of them as toys. And we should grasp here from all four hands, okay, on random on objects. And so you can get an idea of the scope of what the amount of grasp you can go and find in this database. They are. <laughs> and there's a lot of them. But you can index them, which is the beauty of it. So what we we're going to do for data-driven grasping, what we originally did was to say, OK, let's say we have a new, model, new 3D model to grasp. So you can see here this light. We have never seen this before. So what we want to do is find a way to grasp it. But in our database, we have other similar objects. And what we can do is we can find a shape match between this and any of these other objects, take the grasp from this matching shape, and apply it to this object. And so this is the, one of the shapes that match. This is another. And we can then just take this grass and move it over. And if you have enough data, and you can have enough objects, and similarly, you're going to cover a range of geometry and range of scales, um, it works pretty well. And again, it's geometry-based. It doesn't work on material properties necessarily. But you can think of if they're uniform and distributed, it would work reasonably well. Um, so we find the nearest geometric neighbor in the database. And you can use whatever nearest neighbor method for shape imagine you want. We use Zernike moments, which is one way to do it, but you could use others. Um, we collect the pre grass from the neighbor models, and we evaluate the candidates in our simulator to see how good the grasp is. And it worked pretty well. Um, so here's just some other objects. So for example, this is, these three things here are the novel objects we haven't seen. And then we look in our database, and what we're seeing is the sample grasps from something that's a matching shape applied to that. And so it works pretty nicely. I can show you a little video. This video is actually, the reason I'm playing it, not only because it's data-driven grasping, but it's because it was filmed in SID's lab, the Intel lab. OK, um, one of my students came over to use his setup. I don't know if you recognize his little kitchen in the back there. Oh, I have sound on this, sorry.
Let me put that on. Our partial sheet matching and alignment methods, described in detail in the paper, allow the robot to find a similar model from the database and align its scale and pose with a real object on the table. An appropriate grasp is selected, taking into account both forward kinematics and the quality of the grasp from the database. So that's the match and shape in the database. The robot then executes this grasp. Note that this is indeed the same grasp as from the database. The grasp succeeds because objects with similar shapes can be grasped in the same way. Here, we are using the same method to grasp a toy car. This experiment, grasping a glove, shows that although we do not model deformable objects, we can handle them if the deformations are small. We can successfully grasp the controller despite the fact that no controller objects exist in our database because objects with similar shapes do exist. We are also not limited to objects that are smaller than the hand. In this example, we are grasping a ukulele, which is substantially larger than the robotic hand. Finally, we present the failure case. In this example, our assumptions about the material properties of the cone object were incorrect, and the grass fails due to insufficient frictional forces. Okay, so that just gives you a, a background on what we did with our original idea of using large amounts of data to do grasping. So I want to segue now to the next part of the talk where we decided, okay, we should be like everybody else. We should use CNNs, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we feel like we'll join the crowd. Um, and the idea here was, could we use a large data idea with lots of simulation models and a CNN to actually figure out the grasp? And so that's just what this work is. And this was done at IROS 2015. And the idea was to do deep learning. Okay. And one of the things that we wanted to emphasize in all of this work is that we do not think parallel jaw grippers are the final item. Okay, we think multi-finger hands are the final item if you want to try to really do grasping and manipulation. So we don't want to restrict ourselves to just 2D rectangles and grasping this way. We want to say, can you get a grasp with a multi-fingered hand? Okay, and we don't think you should just be able to build, uh, pick things up just from the top. You can do it from any angle that you want. That's a successful grasp. Um, so the grasp database that we talked of before. The cons are you, you have to have a mesh model of the object, and you have to have pose estimation. And what we're saying is maybe we can just get away from those two items by using a CNN, lots of data, and those things are implicit. They come with it. Okay. So what we're trying to do here, our approach, which is up here, is to generate training graphs for known complete mesh models. Okay. So we use the simulator grasp it to do that. And then we can train the CNN to recognize good fingertip and palm placement locations directly from RGBB images. So given an RGBB image, we'll know what looks good okay, for a finger placement. And at runtime, we use the CNN to quickly find grass similar to the training grasp and using simulated annealin to fine tune it to make it a much better grasp. Okay? And the benefits here are it's a full state space. We can go grasp from any direction we want. Okay? Um, we can use high degree of free mend effectors, multi-fingered hands, but we don't have to worry about having to take a single scan, an RGB point cloud, and say we have a mesh. We don't even need that. Um, and we don't have to use pose detection or any of that because it's all implicit in the net. Okay? And we can learn the grass quality function. So how do we do this? Well, we generate grass from, in this case, we're using the Big Bird model data set a few years back. And what we do is we have thousands and thousands and thousands of grasp over lots and lots of objects, and we can cluster these grasps into uh, the eight largest clusters. Eight is an arbitrary number, but it seemed to drop off after eight, uh, into canonical grass types. And then we can render and extract image patches for each finger and the palm for each grasp that we know is a good grasp. So basically we say, okay, we find these grasps that are good on lots and lots of objects, and then we look at the actual data that we're seeing from the camera for each of the finger locations. And what we're going to try to do is we get a new object, we're going to say, can you map a finger to a similar kind of geometry? And that's the general idea. So you can see here, 
for picking up this object. Those are the uh, colors of the position of the palm and the three fingers on a Barrett hand where they would contact this for a lift, okay? And what we're gonna try to do is look at the patches of this RGBD image, okay? Once we figured out where the finger would go and see if we can find them in new data when we actually do experimentation. So the network is fairly straightforward, okay? We put in a full RGB image, okay? And we do a convolution layer and we come out with a heat map. And the heat map is basically for each of the canonical grasp types, which is this N, okay? We get positions of the um, four fingers, the, four, the palm and the three fingers of what that actual location would be if we put the finger there and how good that is. So you can see there are some peaks in here which says this is where you should put your finger and I'll show you a close up of this in a bit. Um, so that's the input, I mean the training. And so, so to do grass planting via these heat maps, what we do is we take an RGB image, okay? We do a segmentation which is nothing special and if we have multiple objects we have to, can apply this to different objects okay we just create a, a quick mesh of the object that we segmented okay and we generate a heat map from we put the image through the heat the um, CNN and that gives me heat maps of where the fingers should go for each of the canonical grasps okay and the, for the best fit so to speak and from that we can then calculate the actual grasp so um, here's a coffee mug, an input, and the generated heat maps. And this is just a blow up. You can see here, these are the heat maps. And so this is showing you where you would put the finger tip based upon the output of this heat map, which is a point which is a good point for it. So what we do is we have an energy measure. So the grass is planned using a linear combination of both the heat map, how close the finger can be to where you want it to be and how good that location would be for that finger, okay? And the contact energy. And the contact energy is simply putting over all the hand uh, volume, how close it is to the object, okay? So we kind of a trade-off between contact, which brings the hand close to the object, and the heat map, which drives the fingers to the contact at the correct positions. And it works very well. So, it works with novel objects, and again, you don't have to do pose estimation, it's just coming for free, so to speak. Again, the full safe base and high degree of freedom hands, um, and it worked as well as data-driven grass quality. The negative is it can only really grasp what is really visible, because you don't know what's behind the object, and you may collide with occluded regions of the object. So we have to be a little careful about that. So we wanna see what we can do to improve that, okay? Um, so that brings us to the next part, which is shape completion. And so the idea is, what if we knew what was behind an object? Well, we don't know, but maybe we could kind of understand what's behind this object, and we can use shape completion to do that. Um, so this is a paper we just did at IROS last year, um, and let me talk about how we do this. Um, The previous planner could only grasp what is visible. We have limited approach directions, and we may collide with occluded regions of the object, so, because we don't know what's behind it, and when we try to put a finger on it, it may not be where, where it's supposed to be. So can we reason about the occlusion and create a scene representation that's more amenable to planning? And this is what we call shape completion enabled robotic grasping. So the idea here is to take a RGBD image, you see up there. And we're using a voxel representation. So we'll treat space as being occupancy grids in 3D, okay? And put that through some CNN, which will then give me a hypothesis of what the full object is. And we do this based upon training data. So here's the basic overview. We have a input of an RGBD image, and we put it into a voxel, go through some standard net stuff, okay, and we come out with a occupancy grid for the voxel, which is completed. How do we do that? So, just as an overview, so basically, the 
image of this object we've never seen before. We don't have the shoe in our database or anything. Um, we get a point cloud, and you can see it's occluded. So we don't have anything that we can see back here. Um, we do a quick segment mesh of that. So we have basically a partial mesh to be grasping on. This goes through the CNN, OK? And the CNN will then output the completed part, OK? And once we get the completed voxelization, then we can mesh it, smooth it, and plan a grasp on it. And we'll show you each of these steps as we go through it. Um, so the training data for this. So what do we do? We took 608 mesh models and 726 unique poses. So we have 441,000 training examples of objects. OK? And we use both the YCB data set and the GRASS data set um, for simulation. And so you can kind of see how this works. We have the model and the pose here. And we get a depth map, OK? We get an occupancy grid, OK? And we can uh, convert this depth map to an oxygen grid, and it'll match it up with the actual ground truth. So we have this map in between a single view of the object and its full voxelization. And we do this for all of the objects we have. So we just did some initial measurements. Um, and we're using Jacquard results, which are intersection over union of the voxel space. So we know if it's an occupied voxel or not, and we compare the two models that way. Um, so the one on the left is the training views. And what that shows you, we did different numbers of training views. With 14 training meshes, OK, you can see that you very quickly learn if you have 14 objects, you can, you can match them. And with 94, it takes a little bit longer, um, but it quickly learns those 94 models. So this is nothing, no holdout models or un unseen models. And the same with 486, although it doesn't learn quite as fast or as, as well, but it's a much bigger space. But it does very high performance. OK, so in this case, on the other side, we have what are called holdout models, OK, which we've never seen before, trying to see how the completions are with what we have. So we'll take an unseen object, get a single view, shape complete it, and compare that with the ground truth object, which it was. And you can see that for the training, 14 training meshes, it really can't do much after a certain point because basically it doesn't have enough data, OK? With 94, it does OK, but you can see that it's outperformed as we go along by the 486. So the 486, because it has seen more stuff, it's able to do more generalization and say, we've, we can come up with a closer approximation. This is just showing you that the more data you have, the better it is. So we also have to do smoothing. So if you, we have a high resolution mesh of the visual portion from the connect, so we get a single depth image, it's pretty high resolution. But the low resolution completion is in a 40 cubed voxel space, okay, which is fairly low resolution. So how do we merge those? Okay, so there's what you see from the connect. And we want to combine them. We upsample the voxel grid output by the CNN, OK? And we can merge the voxel grids and smooth with a implementation, which is very fast, of this paper here, which gives us a more smoothed out object. And since we've done this work, we've actually now are up to 256 cubed. And we're hoping we just did this this week. So we think we're going to get a much higher resolution. And it works pretty well for 40 cubed, but it will work even better for 256 cubed. And for 256 cubed, you can actually go and do not just shape completion, you can do scene completion. So you take entire scene of a room or, or an environment, you can complete everything in it using a larger, resolu higher resolution. So there's a smoothed out object from this method. OK, let me show you a little video. Shape completion is accomplished through the use of a 3D convolutional neural network, or CNN. At runtime, a 2.5D point cloud captured from a single point of view is fed into the CNN. The CNN then fills in the occluded regions of the scene, allowing grasps to be planned and executed on a completed object.
In order to train a network, over 400,000 depth images were captured from 608 objects in simulation. These images were used to create occupancy grids for the portions of the mesh visible from a single point of view, the X shown here. <coughs> the expected output occupancy grid, or Y, was created by aligning the ground truth mesh with the input. At runtime, the point cloud for the target object is acquired from a 3D sensor, scaled, voxelized, and then passed through the CNN. The output of the CNN, a completed voxel grid of the object, goes through a post-processing algorithm that returns a mesh model of the completed object. Finally, a grasp can be planned and executed based on the completed mesh model. Here is an example scene containing three objects which the network has never seen before. In grasp, a user can select the partial meshes one by one Notice the non-target objects have been completed without being post-processed. This way, they can be avoided during planning, but additional time is not wasted on them as they are not going to be grasped. Once the objects have been completed, a target object is selected, and grasped simulated annealing planner is run with the contact of potential quality. The lowest energy reachable grasp is executed. In addition, this work can assist in other robotic tasks such as path planning, where a better understanding of occluded regions is useful. We have posted completions for the entire grasp database fold out set online. Several examples are shown here. Also, the website shows the planned and executed grasp from our experiments in simulation. In conclusion, this work presents a framework to train and utilize a CNN to complete a meshed object generated from a single point of view, and then plan grasps on the completed object. The completion system is fast, with scenes being segmented and completed in a matter of seconds. This system is also able to generalize to novel objects, such as those shown here. OK. So. If you're interested in this, the code, data, et cetera, is here. And you can actually look at these completions over the whole database. Um, and again, just you can see here, this is a toaster. This is the um, ground truth. This is the image we use, and this is the completion. And again, you can go across here, and you can see that it works pretty well. And these are for um, these are simulated objects. These are actual real objects. There's a drill and a cup here, and we'll show you some more completions as we go along. But um, it's a very powerful method of actually figuring out what's going on. Um, we want to kind of get a measure of how good it was. So we have a couple of measures of shape completion itself, how complete the object was versus the ground truth, and also whether it works for grasping. Because really, the ultimate idea here was not just to do shape completion, but to use it for a grasping planner. Okay? So we have Jacquard's similarity, which is basically the um, intersection over union of the voxel sets. The Hausdorff distance, which is a surface distance comparison between the surfaces of the object and the ground truth object. And what we came up with, we meshed them with marching cubes. Geodistic Geodesic distance, which is another measure we can use for a probabilistic way to figure out how good the grasps are. And then we also have a measure for grasp planning, which is once we actually do the grasp, we want to see how good the grasp is compared to what the real grasp we would want to have for that object is. So we have these measures, and I can show you them to you. So for Jacquard similarity, which is the top one, okay, um, we compared it against two other methods. One is basically just taking the partial image and just putting a marching cubes on that and then closing it out, which is kind of dumb because you're only looking at half of it. The other is a mirror uh, kind of symmetry measure, which is a, a paper that's been out there, which kind of takes symmetry axes and try to duplicate the object based upon a symmetry idea. And you can see that the uh, Jacquard similarity is much better in our case. Higher is better here by a, a very large margin. The Hausdorff distance is the same thing. In this case, you want to minimize this distance. It's the average point distance, and so it's closer here than these other methods. Okay? 
And on geodesic divergence, the same thing happens. So in all cases, we find that we do much better than the standard way to do shape completion, which is the mirroring kind of thing um, where you assume an axis of symmetry. In grasping quality, OK, um, we have results from the simulated grasping experiments, OK? Um, and here we have training views, holdout views, and holdout models. So this is basically doing the completion. And really, the one that matters is the holdout model, which is basically things you've never seen before. And you can see that, in this case, our error is much less than um, the others in terms of the pose error. OK? Um, and so this helps the joint value and the pose millimeter error much less. So it's a closer grasp to the real thing. And this is a grasp success rate. It shows the percentage of the successful grasp attempts over all these methods. And so we're basically getting 93% grasp success rate against these other methods. And again, our joint error is fairly low. The time is a little slower, but it's not outrageous. It's only a couple of seconds that we haven't tried to optimize it. And we think it's important to do this for scene understanding, not just for grasping. So as you can see here, we have a planned grasp up on the top left. OK. And when we actually try to do that grasp, you can see we're going to hit this finger as it comes around to try to grasp this. It's going to hit this other object. There's a collision there. And we don't obviously know what's behind this object, because you can see over here in the scan, this is unknown because of the angle we took the, the picture from. But clearly, when you plan the grasp, you don't know what's here. But when you use our method, you do know what's there. So you can actually plan ahead of time because you've completed all the objects in the scene. And so for path planning, this is very important. So you know if you want to have an arm get in the way, you know the path that you can take and the trajectory in which you'll not have a collision. And again, we would like to go not just from shape completion, but to take it up one notch to sink understanding. And we've done a small amount of that with these small number of cluttered objects. But you can imagine just doing the whole scene all, all at once. OK, so what are the key ideas from that? It's fast, works online. So once you have the training done, you can just give it an RGB image, and you'll get a completed object. Um, the smoothing is also fast. So even though it's at 40 cubed at this case, it gets smoothed out very nicely for grasping. We can do scene completion for path planning. And we have open source data and code, which you can all keep an eye out for. Um, and it outperforms the other methods. But there's always a but. Um, you can still have occlusion to cause error. So even if you do the shape completion, for example, if you look at a coffee mug and you can't see anything of the handle, you're looking the other direction from where the handle is, it's not clear you're going to get a completion that's going to have the handle because it doesn't really know it's there. So what can we do about that? That's, that's the problem. And the solution is to add contact data from unseen regions to improve the completion. So how do we do that? Well, this is visual tactile reasoning, which we submitted to ICRA. Um, and here we're trying to improve the shape completion with visual and tactile sensory data, not just the RGB camera. So hopefully we can handle occlusion better. So what are we going to do? Well, this picture looks somewhat familiar because we said, OK, we have this nice voxel representation of space, occupancy grid. And so what we can do is we can take our voxelized depth, which is what we've seen up till now, that top pipeline. But we can also add in voxelized tactile data, which are those red dots, and then try to see if that will improve the completion. So we have fused depth and tactile data, but they fuse into the same voxel representation. And then we can get a new completion based upon using both multimodal uh, modalities. Um, the architecture of the CNN is the same. We haven't, didn't have to change that. We just have to add this new data from the tactile. So how do we get the tactile data? Well, we do tactile exploration. We can perform garter moves until contact from behind the object. And we don't even have to do any kind of heavy 
next best view, planning ahead, although we might want to do that in the future, we just come in from behind the, the Z direction of wherever you took the picture from and just say, what's back there, okay? And we get very sparse tactile data, very limited amount, okay? Does that make a difference? Um, so we tried this. We did uh, 608 objects from both the YCB and graph data sets. Um, from that, we got 500,000 triplets generated in simulation, which is the ground truth voxel grid of the object, the voxelized range image, and the voxelized tactile contacts. In the case, we just had like 40 samples behind the object, not very many. And you could probably go uh, less, but we, that's what number we used. And we built two CNNs to test the system, one using the depth only CNN and one using depth and tactile CNN. Okay? And we did data split of 87 training, 20% testing, and this is some of the results we get. So in this case, it's a little hard to see up here, but there's some blue dots, which are the tactile data, okay? The red data is the RGBD data, okay? And just with a small amount of extra tactile information, these completions become much better, okay? So you can actually figure out what's behind this and do a very good reconstruction of them based upon that limited amount. And we also have this data available at this website, so you can actually take these simulated range images and tactile completions, do your own thing on them based on how you want to try it. And we have a, a simulator for a Barrett hand in this case that we use for the, the tactile data. So I can show you a quick video here. Shown here, depth information captured via a Microsoft Connect and tactile information captured through several exploratory motions contacting the occluded side of the object are concatenated into a fused visual tactile representation, which is fed into a CNN to produce a mesh prediction as shown on the right. We then plan a grasping task on the object, shown here. Shown are training examples with depth information in red and tactile information in blue in the middle. Our completion is on the top and the ground truth is on the bottom. This system is fast because of offline training, uses multimodal sensory information, and requires no additional pose detection or localization. So Again, we wanted to try to see how good it was, so we did some comparisons against other methods that are out there. Um, so for partial completion, which is one of the things we're going to test about, um, we did connect and tactile data points concatenated and meshed using marching cubes. So we just built a mesh around the very dense um, vision data and the sparse tactile data. Um, and we found it was unable to predict a lot of the missing data because it just didn't have enough uh, data. We'll show you some numbers in this in a second. We also tried a convex hull. So if you figure out you've got the points behind and you got a little bit in and you have a lot in front, you can convex hull it to get something. And again, it inaccurately fills the region of space that are unseen. Um, we used Gaussian process implicit surfaces, which tended to create large unbounded objects, which is a method of filling in the gaps, so to speak. And we also used the same shape metrics before, Jacquard distance and Hausdorff distance to measure how well this worked, okay? So here are the results, and again, we have training views, which are just nothing but training data and testing on training data. Holdout views, which is training data, but with novel views of that data. So rather than using the exact same position, we took the camera to take a novel view. A holdout model was novel simulated views of models not in the training data. And really, this is the one that mounts holdout live, which is real YCB real views of YCB objects, so using real data rather than simulated data, okay? And if you look at the results, in all the cases, um, we did much better. Not so much better in, in these uh, simulated things, but in the holdout live, you notice there's a big gap here. And that's because it really does work better with real data. Um, same with this, okay? With the live holdouts, which is the real data, it's improved quite a bit in house store difference as well as Jacquard similarity, okay? Um, this is um, just a compendium of some of the objects from this, and this is, these are the real objects that we used 
which are from the YCB database. Um, and so we did the completions on all of these objects using both visual and sparse tactile. Okay, so you can see here the amount of data that we have for both the red, which is the vision, and the blue, which is the tactile. And it works really well in terms of being able to do outperform these other methods. And so this is the actual ones that we did. This is the ground truth in the very bottom row. This is our method here. And then you can look across and see the other methods. And again, it performed pretty well. So it particularly helps in cases like this. So for example, if you're looking at the famous Ikra rubber, rubber ducky, which most of you probably know about, okay, um, if you take a head-on view of it, you're not going to have any idea what's back here. Okay? And so if you do depth-only completion, this is what you get. Okay? But if you add just a very small amount of tactile data, you get a much better completion. Same with the picture up top. And so this is the idea here is that you don't have to have lots and lots of extra data, but just enough so it can lock in, okay? And this is just showing you some of the differences for the holdout live reel where it really does make a difference compared to the other methods, the improvement over just the depth only method. So we did some comparisons again. Um, once an object is completed, we need plan, plan a grasp on the completion. So not only do we want to do shape completion, we want to pick it up and see if that worked better because we have a better model, hopefully. Um, so we compared 7,900 7, graphs on a complete object in simulation using uniform sampling around the objects to try to pick it up from different positions. Okay? We use grasp to plan each grasp on the completed object. The grasps were then executed not on the completed object, but the ground truth object. So basically we did, okay, for the completed model, Try different graphs around the model, find the best grasp in our simulator, okay? Take that grasp, those joint angles, and now apply it to the actual object, because that's what we're picking up, not our model of that from our, our algorithm, and see how good that is, okay? And so we actually know whether it works on real objects. And we measured the Cartesian pose error of each finger, um, and also the joint space error from all seven joints to the Barrett hand. And again, we did much better than the other methods. So here you can see these Grasper results. So pose error results, which is basically the Cartesian pose differences, um, were much better in terms of the, particularly in the holdout live, which is the real data. Here our average error is six millimeters, others are much higher. Okay, and joint error, again, we have two degree, two and a half degree error versus these others. So we figured that this, is actually improving the grasp to the point where we're actually be able to pick these things up better. And so we did try to pick them up. So we have a lifting success um, using the YCB real objects. And again, um, we outperformed. So basically, the lift success here is for these other methods, which we talked about. Um, ours is 87.5%. Um, the joint error is much less. And the time is a little slower, but it's certainly not much slower. And we think that this is still a very good way to go. Key points. Even sparse tactile data, not much, can make large improvements in your completion as well as then your grasping on that model. This is a second bullet is, is kind of an important one. There are other methods people use for visual tactile fusion. So a typical way to do this is to take a RGBD image of this, okay, do some reasoning, and then just do a local change where you touch and then iteratively improve your model each time you touch it. But the problem with that is those are only local changes. But because we're using a CNN, which takes into account all the data, we can do non-local changes in global shape based upon small amounts of tactile data. So the CNN can store this global information and allow you to, to do non-local changes, which is really what we're looking for, rather than to find small changes locally. Um, the voxel representation is a really good way to anchor for any relevant 3D data to be added to the system. So again, we're improving the uh, resolution of that. And as we get higher and higher resolution, as NVIDIA gets bigger and bigger cards, okay, we hope that this will be a non-issue, okay? But even a 40 cubed, it works pretty well. So let me just summarize what I've been talking about, and then I want to show you one more thing. 
Um, the first thing we talked about was generating multi-finger graphs via deep learning. Um, and it's a learned notion of graph stability, which enables fast and semantically meaningful graph planning. I think the key thing to take away from that is, you know, it's modelless. You just don't have to worry about the object model or the pose. You're just taking the data. And if the data is rich enough, it does work. OK? Um, the second one was nice. But again, it had the problem where um, detailed completion case partially with the CNN output, OK? But it can handle occlusion as well. And the last one will really handle occlusion because you are actually looking at places that you can't see from the camera, but you can touch. And depending on how much data you have, you can either use par partial visual, partial tactile, whatever, to get by with that. So one other thing that I want to mention is novel tactile sensors that we're building. Um, two things. Obviously, we're very interested in using touch for this process to see what's behind it. If you look in the video, when we touched the picture, it kind of moved a little bit. And so one of the things we're trying to do is build tactile sensors that are sensitive enough that you don't have to worry about the object moving when you push it. OK? So if you have the good enough tactile sensor, you can do that. And we're building an integrated strain gauge and piezoelectric sensor that can detect force and slip uh, simultaneously. I'm doing this with Giannis Kimis and Carolyn Yu at Columbia Laboratory for Unconventional Electronics, the Clue Lab, OK? And basically, we have the ability to have a shadow mask and a photolithography pattern, uh, PVDF, and we can do, simply adhere it to the Barrett hand or whatever hand you want, and it's flexible. It's on a flexible substrate. So one of the things you find with tactile sensing is most tactile sensors are flat pads. So when you touch like this, it's OK. But the sides of fingers, regions like that, are very important in grasping. And so if you can make this a flexible substrate to wrap around a hand in a non-planar way, you can get much better performance. And so hopefully I'll have some results to show you that soon. But this is one of the things that we're actually building and trying to do to improve the tactile performance of this. OK. Um, I think that's it. Um, be glad to take any questions. Um, Yeah. Um, when you were doing the shape completion using the tactile, it seemed like you were using a pretty nice robot arm for that. And I was curious what you thought it would do under with a higher uncertainty robot arm, like you have worse forward kinematics. Clearly, calibration is always a problem. So yeah, we were we had a good calibrated arm, and I think that's a good point. Um, one thing we didn't do is was you know, perturb the tactile, which we could try. We could just put some noise on top of it, and then we could s try to see if what your question is. We could answer your question. So if we had a, a noisy tactile, what, would we still get a good completion? I don't know the answer to the question. It's a good question, but I really don't know. Clearly, the more accurate your data, the better you will do. OK? Um, but it's, it's interesting. I know a few people here are working on um, pose error and, and trying to get um, kind of low-cost robotic arms to do things, even though there's a lot of error. So it's a it's, it's good, good question. I don't really have a good answer. But I may go back this week and say to my student, you know, throw some noise into that and see what happens. Uh, I mean, I will say this right off the bat. Even though we calibrate the robot, it has some error, clearly. Because you're going through this kinematic chain to the wrist. There's some error there. Then you have the Barrett hand. And if you work with the Barrett hand, you know there's some error there. And then you have the location of the tactile sensor. So, you know, I, I, I feel good that it's, it's got some error already. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. see the robot hand. You don't need the kinematics. I'm sorry? You see the uh, You mean you're, so I could use a visual calibration? You see the object. You see the object. <laughs> yeah. You use vision. Uh, I, it's come from behind. <laughs> it's come from behind. I can't see it. Your fingers stick out. No, they don't. Not behind a picture. I can't see it. <laughs> All right. However, I just bought a hand that has a little camera in it, so we'll try that. Okay. I was actually wondering, so you just mentioned you bought a hand that has a camera in it. Yeah. What if you uh, moved around with that arm to get a full, like a full 3D? I mean, you, you could certainly get, a, you know, take 
pure three division around it, but we're trying to do this just from a one shot. So let's say you're just walking down the street, your mobile robot, you want to complete it right away. So yeah, you clearly, if you have the ability to get full sensor data, sure, you can do that. Yeah. I don't, and we saw that too. I'm not really sure why. Um, and it may just be the data set we had. I, I don't really know, but it's a good question. Yeah. So it uh, looks like the ship completion works really well. I wonder if we want to use a method in a cluster setting. For example, you have a bunch of objects lying around very close to each other. Yeah. What do you say other we, we've, the only clutter we've done is non-contact kind of clutter. So it works in that case. We haven't tried that, but that's a very good point, that if you have things that overlap, what does the completion do? It, it's a function of, first of all, can you segment them out before you do that? So if you could get a good segmenter, then you could run the shape completion, and that would work too. Okay? But if you don't have a good segmentation, then it's going to try to maybe fuse these two objects together, and that's, that's a problem. Okay, so yeah, if, if, it's, if it's things are overlapping, it could be an issue. Yeah? So this question is going to get us talking about Trump very quickly. <laughs> um, you generate fake data. I, I wouldn't use that word, but. <laughs> it is fake data. No, it's real data, it's just simulated. Return, pretend it's real. Yeah. Meaning your planning algorithms have lost the ability to plan using uncertainty. In other words, to say, well, I think the back of this right, object looks right. like this, but I'm not sure, so I'll do a grass that right. takes that into account. Right. Why not explicitly represent uncertainty? Well, in some sense we do, because we do have a metric of how good our fake news is versus <laughs> reality. So we have a metric, and we said, you know, we're two millimeters off. And so, you know, I, I have that measurement for every point. You can turn that into a probabilistic measure if you want, because I have a confidence measure there for each point, right? So I, I could do that if I wanted to, but I just haven't done that. Okay? Yeah. I can ask a follow-up. Sure. <laughs> but your press will be taken. Right. And in fact, all your models look so easy to grasp because they have so many local But But we, we do the grass planning on the smooth model. We don't do it on that model. We have a smoother. So we smooth it out, and then we do the grass planner. OK, but your completion has exactly the same problem. So why not attempt to get some surface patch representation, say it's smooth on this side, it's likely to be smooth on the other side and explicitly represent. I actually think the nature of the surface is far more important than the shape of the object. Oh, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. If it's, huh. if it's sandpaper, shape doesn't matter much. Yeah, but we don't pick up sandpaper very often, OK? <laughs> we take a, pick up smooth objects. Um, so I mean, you're, you're making a good point. We don't know material properties. And so that's something that the grass planner has no clue about. Okay, which is important. Okay, but I, I still think that you know um, we have the ability to do some kind of reasoning about this um, without having to worry about you know whether it's smooth or not. And again, we have a smoothing operation which takes away the voxelization. Okay, so then we do the planning on that and not on the on the, the coarse voxel, so to speak. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, a voxel, yeah. Is, is it probabilistic? Like, no, well, um, no, we're not using a probabilistic. We, we could put a confidence measure on it, but we do, yeah. But we have to downsample and upsample, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we could do put a confidence measure on it. Yeah. So um, the fact that this works as well as it does <laughs> means that there's uh, uh, it, it lives in a universe of shapes that I don't know how to characterize. And maybe we as a field don't know how to characterize, but we can build this thing that does well 
in that universe of objects. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to characterize that universe of objects, and you've been thinking about it for a long time, so how do you characterize that universe of objects? Discontinuous. That's exactly how I do it. You know, you, you can't assume anything about objects in which you have a smooth manifold and you can get onto them. So because it's so discontinuous, I don't think you can try to characterize it other than implicitly what you get from it. Um, and, you know, the, the discontinuities are, are there. And, and from our standpoint of trying to grasp planning, that's the hardest part. So, you know, if you have a grasp and you think it's good, it could be off by just a little bit and it'll be a bad grasp. So I don't know the answer to your question, um, but I think it's one where we're saying, I mean, this is not a new idea to put a mesh over the world and abstract it, okay? And so what we're saying here is we can put this mesh over the world, turn it into a lower dimensional, easier to understand world that still has some fidelity, although Chris might argue with that, um, still has some fidelity with the re reality. And since we know how to work in this new reduced space, we can do things with it. But, um, you know, if you, clearly, you know, we can do novel objects, but there are certain novel objects that nobody can do because we've never seen them and they could be really weird. So if one of, one of Howie's snake robots is, uh, you know, we're looking at head on, we're not sure what's behind it. You know, we can't tell. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Let, let, me, uh, let me see, do I have another one? I think I have another one. Okay. Might have distracted myself thinking about the first one. Why you're pawn, okay. Tactile data, yeah. data. So um, you're using tactile data that looks an awful lot like visual data. So you know, Very you much. there's a point on the surface here. It's points. Um, you can get tactile data, or I'll say more broadly, haptic data that could be useful. There's lots of information there. There are projects where you can see that there's lots of information there that can be used in principle. And I'm wondering, and, and as an example, I'll just say, maybe, you know, even if this finger were numb, if I'm doing something like this and I see it move or I feel a force, right, I know I made contact, but it would be ambiguous, right? So there are lots of, lots of information like that. Right. And I'm wondering, is there any way to extend your work with the CNN to include data that doesn't really match up with the... Uh, that almost maps to his question about noisy error. Um, so the question oh. is, no, to, I, I don't know your name, <laughs> uh, with this gentleman here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you're, you have noisy data, you're going to be off. You don't know where it is. Um, clearly, um, it will give you a, a, a representation that tries to, to, to bring that data into the C from the CNN, but whether it's going to be good, I don't know. But you make a good point that, you know, maybe we have find a way to do that. Um. Do I get to ask the last question? I'm sure there's more out there. Okay, suppose uh, I... <laughs> Thanks suppose for I'm listening. So devious. No, I got one more, I got one more. Okay, I'm let me so go devious. back. Sorry. I'm going to look at your paper. I'm going to go get one of those half-assed shell-looking objects, and I'm going to 3D print it. And then when you're not looking, I'm going to visit your lag. I'm going to sneak it in there, and I'm going to show it to your robot. Yeah. Is that going to break your uh, system? I don't think so. No. <laughs> no. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Again, thank you for coming out on a Friday afternoon. I appreciate that. <laughs>